welcome ajit to today's webinar it's i'm so glad to uh, to have you on the panel ajit pjm is a new amc in india do you want to tell us a little bit about it sure anup uh, firstly uh, thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction uh, i'm happy to be here with uh, all of you and all of our, our viewers uh, as you mentioned uh, anup uh, pjm is uh, a new brand uh, as far as many of the indian investors are concerned but uh, let me tell you that uh, pjm is nothing but prudential global investment managers so this is the prudential of the us and it's an over 140 year old uh, entity in the world so a very uh, experienced uh, asset manager and uh, pjm itself uh, manages it is the 10th largest asset manager in the world so that is uh, one uh, easiest description to give about pjm manages over 1.5 trillion dollars of assets uh, globally that's a little about 100 lakh crores that it manages itself actually about 109 lakh crore uh, to just put it in perspective the entire mutual fund industry in india is currently 33 lakh crore and growing well uh, it is uh, you know been very well known for its performance across the platform of its equity and fixed income products uh, it is the fastest growing active manager uh, in the world and it has over 1300 investment professionals uh, you know working for it so one advantage i have in running pjm india here with my team is that i do get a lot of insights and uh, thought leadership articles and content from our parent in the us uh, and given that things are so global things that are global affect everything uh, you know here in india and for investors in india it is a big you know advantage to have of course a lot of people today while they don't know about uh, pjm and uh, uh, if they know it they know it as the prudential of the us many people know about prudential of the uk which is in india as icici prudential very different companies two different no connection between the two uh, but we are a very large entity and technically we are probably the largest multinational brand in india in this particular space but as pjm india we have a long way to go but thank you for having me here so i'll hand it over back to you thank you ajit for that introduction of pjm uh, it 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 looks great as you all may know scriptbox is india's most trusted digital wealth management service at scriptbox we believe that good investing is not just about choosing a fund it's about understanding your aspirations and goals building a portfolio and managing it actively so that you do not compromise on your dreams we are a sebi registered investment advisor we keep sharing insights ideas and content on a regular basis on topics related to investments aspirations life goals leadership and health please visit our website scriptbox.com social media platform and channel scriptbox on youtube if you like this webinar do tweet about it mentioning the handle scriptbox we have recently launched international stocks offering through our partnership with stockal please check this out on our platform when we think of the army the only two words that come to my mind are immense respect because of the army we feel secure and can sleep peacefully at night my sincere gratitude to each and every army personnel for keeping our safety above everything what sometimes we do not realize is that the army has also given us many innovations and ways that we can adopt in our normal lives darpanet defense advance research projects agency network was funded in the late 1960s by an arm of the us defense department with a purpose to link computers at pentagon funded research institution over telephone lines this evolved into what we know today as the internet amongst many such things is z kit bag army's mission planning framework captain raghu raman has said that the army's lessons are written in blood because mistakes come back in body bags so it is important that the framework is robust army's z kit bag framework can be applied in many many situations abhi to asli manzil pana baki hai abhi to iradon ka imtihan baki hai abhi to toli hai mutthi var zameen abhi to tolna aasman baki hai whether you want to run a marathon or you want to begin your startup journey or want to invest or anything you want to do in life you need to have irada and tariqa when you are building a portfolio the irada are aio life goals for your portfolio tariqa is asset allocation and product selection having a framework a tight sequence while 
planning your investment journey is essential because mistakes can lead to financial disasters. Today, Ajit will show us how to use it to navigate investment, investment biases, what irada and tarika are required there. Over to you, Ajit, for Z Kitback framework. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anup. And uh, you laid the groundwork uh, perfectly for me uh, with uh, your you know, perspective on the army. And I share that with you completely. So welcome once again to all the viewers uh, here today. As uh, Anup mentioned, the Z Kit bag is uh, the army's mission planning framework. And uh, if you watch some of Captain Raguraman's videos on YouTube, you will probably hear him speak about ZKit bag as well and about its ability to be used in various circumstances, whether you're a startup or whether you know you are you know you're setting out on any kind of mission. Uh, I've always uh, you know had a, a positive bias uh, towards uh, the army. I always wanted to be in the army myself, but here I am, the mutual fund business. But I've kept in touch and I thought that this is a great way to bring the concept of, uh, you know, some of the common mistakes that we may make while we uh, go in our investment journey. And how is it that we can probably use the ZKitback framework to mitigate some of those risks? So let me dive into the presentation. And uh, in the presentation, the first uh, uh, you know, thing that I, I, I want to talk about is uh, actually something out of Indian mythology. And there's an interesting twist to it when I come to it, but I'll tell you, uh, you know, why I have picked up uh, that little leaf of mythology. And then we will talk about the Z-Kit bag and how you can use the Z-Kit bag to really win in the mind uh, as far as the investing game goes and maybe make some conclusions at the end of it. So let's go right ahead and take this leaf out of mythology. I'm quite confident that uh, most or all of you have read the Mahabharata, heard many stories about the Mahabharata, or watched it on TV like most of us uh, probably have. And uh, we are all familiar with the story of the Mahabharata. But there is something called the esoteric meaning of the Mahabharata, a hidden meaning in the Mahabharata itself, where it tends to describe an individual a single human being and the fight that is going on within ourselves. And how does one interpret it? Let me take you through that. We all know that Dhridrashtra, uh, the king, was blind. Now, in the esoteric meaning of the Mahabharata, Dhridrashtra, the blind king, is associated with the brain. Our brain, our you know, center of processing all of our decisions, all of what we do, all of what we think, is essentially blind. It doesn't, uh, you know, get to know things itself. What it does is work, act, reacts to all the impulses that it gets through the nervous system all across the body, right? So by itself, it is blind and it is influenced through all of the impulses that it gets from outside and inside the body. And many of these impulses could be negative influences and biases that keep us from achieving our true goal. And therefore the hundred Kauravas, they are considered the negative influences and the biases. There are a hundred negative influences and biases that can influence your brain. But then how do you control this? How do you win this? In comes the five Pandavas. The five Pandavas are really representative of your five senses. Every human being has just five senses of sight, smell, you know, uh, hearing, taste, and touch. So if you are awake to your five senses, and if you can control your five senses, you can win over the Kauravas, or rather the negative influences that attack you as a human being or attack or influence your brain. But the five senses itself on its own or independently is not something that can possibly help. It needs to all come together. It needs purpose and it needs passion. And that's where Draupadi comes in. The character Draupadi is representative of the passion that keeps the five brothers together or in an esoteric sense, the five senses of a human being together to fight against the Kauravas. I'm sure you would have guessed Krishna. Krishna is the soul, the conscience of a human. 
and the guiding sort of principles, the values, the, the things that are in our software, in a, matter of, in a manner of speaking, that guide us forward. So Krishna is that soul. But the most interesting aspect when you think about the uh, story of the Mahabharata related to a single human being and the sort of fight that goes on inside of all of us is who is Karna? Because for all of us who know the Mahabharata, we know that Karna was the eldest brother, was part of the five Pandavas actually, or rather the first Pandava in a sense, uh, because coming from the same mother. And the answer is that Karna represents the ego. Every human being has an ego, from a baby to an adult. We all have our ego. And it is said, therefore, in the Mahabharata, maybe through the story, but one part of ourselves has to be killed if we have to win the spiritual and the game of life. And that is, if you can at least subdue or kill the ego, Ego is the one that tends to lead most of us into many of the problems that we have in our personal or professional life. So just to conclude on this very quickly, our brain is essentially blind and it's influenced by a hundred different negative emotions, influences and biases. But the five senses with the help of an able sarathi can win over them. And you have to get rid of the ego if you really want to win the ultimate war. I don't know how much of this you will agree with, but I find it a very interesting perspective to just think about you know, how intelligent were our ancestors when they weaved these stories and one could make connections to what is happening in our own lives. With that, let me jump straight into the Z-Kit bag, which is also a framework to try and help understand what is possibly happening to us in various scenarios of our investment uh, and savings journey and how can we take care of it. Now, of course, I wanna give credit to Captain Raghu Raman. He's the one who uh, I, I remember reading many, many years ago about an article that he had written on the Z Kit bag. And it struck me then that it is such a beautiful framework that it can be used for uh, a lot of purposes, especially when it comes to planning anything specific. Of course, Captain Raghu Raman has uh, 11 years in the Indian Armed Forces, more than a decade, more than a decade in corporate life was the first CEO of the National Intelligence Grid and has been group president at, at, at Reliance Industries. He's the author of Every Man's War and he's a fellow of the Observer Research Foundation. Um, love to hear him on TED Talks or any of the other videos that you can probably catch. But as Anup mentioned earlier, one of the sayings that, uh, one of the quotes that I read about Captain Raghuraman, which I like very much, is that the army's lessons are written in blood because mistakes come back in body bags. The reason I want to introduce the Z-Kit bag framework into our investment journey is because of this. As Anup mentioned earlier, mistakes can cause financial disruption and ruin. So you can't afford to make mistakes. You've got to guard against mistakes. You've got to guard against the risks. So your planning framework, the only thing that you can control, you know, as they say, control the controllables. You can't control the market. You can't control people's opinion, but you can control your process. So if you have a strong process and framework, you're much likelier to win at what you are attempting to do. Let me quickly take you through what the Z Kit bag stands for. Uh, it is obviously an acronym, uh, some of which Anup mentioned, but let me take you through the whole. Z stands for Zamini Nishan. K stands for cover. I stands for irada. And mind you, all of this is a sequence when it comes to planning a mission, as far as the army is concerned. P stands for Tarika, B stands for Bandobast, A stands for Administration, and G, the most interesting of all, stands for Ghadi Milao. Very quickly, when an army is setting out on a mission, uh, it has to first study the terrain. Where are you going to operate? You need to know where you're going to operate so that you are completely ready. Just as a startup, if you're going to do a business, you may have a great plan, but you need to understand the context and you need to understand the environment in which you're going to operate. So this is nothing but the theater of war in which an army or a mission is, is, is being done. And you gotta know whether you're gonna operate on mountains, in the sea, on, you know, in a desert, on lakes or in the forest. So you need to know your zameen. 
The next is cover, most importantly, information about the enemy and information about yourself. So you need all the intelligence that you can get before you can launch into the mission. So the next important step before you go uh, with your guns blazing is to make sure that you have all the right information with you. Irada is the third step. Once you know the terrain, once you have the information, you better fix your goal, your, you know, what is the actual goal of the mission? Are you going to be capturing a peak and that you need to be capturing that peak by say, you know, a particular time, or you're going to blow up a bridge or that you are going to, uh, you know, bring back uh, your colleagues across the enemy line. What is the mission? And it's very important for the army to be very clear about this because the troops on the ground, most of them are not likely to be, you know, highly intellectual or, you know, or, or, or educated uh, forces. And so it has to be simple enough for them to understand and execute. That can make all the difference between winning or losing. The next step, of course, is tariqa, as you uh, can rightly understand. The technique, the strategy that you will adopt to fulfill that mission. What is the technique? And once you know the technique, you then get to bandobas, which means I know the technique. I know now what is the bandobas I need to do? What are the resources I need? Do I need air cover? Do I need artillery shelling before I enter into the, into the field? And uh, do I, what kind of equipment do I need? All of those comes in Bandobas. Administration is the logistics part of it, including the metrics of measurement. There has to be somebody in the, not, in, not necessarily only in the field, but back at the headquarters who's measuring progress of that mission and making sure that things are going step by step and to plan. So the logistics and the monitoring is the second last step. The last step is Khadi Milao, which means that every soldier that is going on that mission needs to synchronize their watches with the watch of their commander. It's a very important step because if the commander is going to you know, give you instructions which are extremely precise time-based, that there is artillery shelling that's going to start at 645, 0, 0645 as the army would say, your watch can't be 10 minutes behind. You will be in the theater of war when the shelling starts. You can't afford to do that. So you need to be synchronized. And being synchronized is the last step. So with that, let me take you through how you can use the Z kit bag in, uh, in, in, in your investment journey and use this framework to understand the risks or the biases that can affect you. And what are the questions you should be asking yourself so that you can mitigate that uh, particular risk, or you can win uh, on every step of the journey. So let's start with the first one, Zamini Nishan. As I mentioned, the Zamini Nishan is nothing but the theater of war or terrain. And the job I think for an investor here is when you think about the terrain of investments is simply to familiarize yourself with that field of play. What are all of the things that you're going to be uh, involved with? And familiarizing yourself with the, with the whole territory that you're entering into is the first step. Of course, to me, I think it is that, you know, where you're going to play is both the Indian economy and the global economy, both of it, because your investments are going to be impacted by what's happening, not just in India, but all over the world. And I think the pandemic is a perfect example for all of us to think about it as well. So let's think about investing. And why are we saying this? Investing is about buying businesses and becoming an owner. Investing in equity, especially, is about buying businesses and becoming an owner. What is the definition of a good business? A good business's simplest definition is that it is a continually growing business. Growing businesses, more often than not, or almost always, is actually leveraging talent and human ingenuity. And human ingenuity and innovation is global. Today in the pandemic, when you sit around and you're watching Netflix, it's a streaming business and it started off somewhere in the world, a fantastic innovation, whether we think of Uber or many other such services which we use here today in India, is the result of great innovation, not just technology being leveraged for it, but human creativity, human ingenuity, and human innovation. So. When you therefore think about this one step that you should be worried about 
or the risk or the bias that you may have in the first step of your investing journey is that you may have the home bias. And a lot of investors have it. If you picked up the latest report from the Reserve Bank of India, it would tell you that 99.99% of investments across Indians are in India. And very, very few people think about investing internationally, even though uh, that opportunity is there and there are many routes. And Anup just spoke, spoke about Stockel uh, a little while ago as well. So we've got to think about it that, you know, India is a $3 trillion economy, but there's a, you know, $90 trillion economy out there in the world. And if you, even if you look at market capitalizations of what is over here in India at two and a half or $86 trillion or you know, closer to 90 over there internationally, why would you just invest in the three, you know, two and a half trillion when you know you could potentially invest also in the eighty-six trillion, you know, global market cap that is out there? So the the question that anyone should probably be asking in this step is, how narrow or wide is my playing field? That's one of the first steps before just jumping in and saying, hey, let's do this and let's do that. Let's figure out the theater of war, the field of play that you are entering. Let's look at the next step, cover. And I spoke about it. It's information on the enemy, on oneself. And I, I feel that from an investor's perspective, what I'm trying to talk about over here is, do you have actionable intelligence? Just having a lot of information is not enough. Do you have actionable intelligence? And that's where I'm sure, uh, you know, Scriptbox, for instance, uh, comes in to give you some of those actionable intelligence. But let me also say that, you know, it's, it's your, you know, you've got to think about your filter to gauge your enemy. And in your investment journey, your enemy is inflation, volatility, taxes, and your personal biases as well, right? Those are your enemies. And, you know, for me, when I think about it, inflation is very central to it. And the reason why I think inflation is central to it is because interest rates are connected to inflation. And when interest rates change, it does impact both equity and fixed income and all of almost all of the other asset classes that you would be investing in. So to me, that's quite central. Higher inflation will mean higher interest rates and vice versa. Higher interest rates is good for savers, but bad for business. And lower interest rates may be bad for savers, but it's good for business. Already, when you have actionable intelligence, you know, which way you need to maybe tilt. And I'm sure most of you are thinking interest rates are down. I, what, why do I, the money in the bank is not earning too much. Some of the fixed income investments are not earning too much. And I think this is simply the connection that you make. And if you have good intelligence, uh, or I'm saying actionable intelligence about the enemy, then you are able to take some decisions. But let's look at the bias. The bias that comes when, it, when we talk about information is herd behavior just too much information from all sources. And I'm sure most of you will agree with me that in a digital world, and uh, as they call WhatsApp University, you have so many things thrown at you and information coming to you that it only tends to confuse you. It only tends to, you know, uh, make you feel, what the hell am I supposed to do in this? So I was about to mention that this uh, just, uh, about the WhatsApp, something... a lot of information being available. <laughs> available and uh, like uh, too much, and how too do you much, make it right? actionable right yeah absolutely how do you make it actionable so so you know in this i think the question that you you need to be simply thinking about is more common sense than anything else but to say you know how do i differentiate between fact and opinion right because most people tend to give their opinions and uh, i think while it's good to hear because you may follow some of those people and you like some of those people and they're experts that's fine but also try and look at see if the facts of it sometimes opinions are just opinions right At the end of the day and i think the you know the kind of content that sometimes scriptbox puts out to all of you and i've seen some of it gives you a good understanding or an information about what's happening with facts and figures and you know you know that's very helpful when you're trying to take some decisions as well so actionable intelligence. The next step is Irada, the mission statement or the objective. And this is a simpler one to talk about because as you would know, this is goal, all your goals. And it is very, very important that you approach investments with a sense of a goal in mind. 
And your goals could be short term or they could be long term. But goals have to be smart. S-M-A-R-T. Smart, right? Specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. If the goal that you've defined for yourself does not measure up to any one of these factors, it is not a goal. I mean, well, you could, you could say, uh, you know, when you start your job saying, I'm going to buy a Ferrari for myself and that's what I want. Well, it's not wrong. It's quite specific and you can, you know, measure it. And of course you could achieve it as well. Uh, I, I wouldn't say uh, that nobody can achieve it. You could achieve it. It's not being unrealistic, but then, hey, what's your time frame and how, right? So you've got to think about whatever goal you have in, in, in a clear way. And I do think that the smart formula or being specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound is a good way of, of defining what your goals could be. I, sim I, I personally think that retirement or uh, it should be your priority number one. I, I tend to talk about retirement as financial freedom because I think retirement is a fuddy-duddy old world now. The more, you know, PGM India has done a, a retirement readiness survey in India and the feedback we get is people today or the millennials or the new investors don't think about retirement in the way the older generations used to think. They want to work forever. But what they would like to think about is financial freedom. It's just another word for retirement. Right, so that you are financially free, your source of income is, is, is taken care of, so that you can do whatever you like with your time, your passion, your hobby, or the thing that you're most uh, you know, interested to do in, in, in life. The reason I, however, keep retirement as uh, I would like people to have uh, retirement as the first goal is for uh, a slightly different uh, you know, perspective or reason. Retirement is the only financial goal in your life for which you do not get a loan. Let me repeat that. Retirement is the only financial goal in life for which you do not get a loan. All your other financial goals, you want to buy a house, you want to buy a car, you want to start a business, you want to send your kids for a great education in India or abroad, what, you know, have a fancy wedding, whatever it is, there's a loan for it, but no loan for retirement. Right. And so it's important that you save early for retirement and that, you know, you make that corpus your first number one priority. Uh, the bias in this step of irada or, or planning your goal is recency bias, right? Loss aversion bias. That's another term for it. And it is a bias where, you know, the most recent big negative or positive, positive news will impact your decision making. Here you are on your journey to set up a nice retirement corpus over the next 15 years. Two years in, there is a pandemic, and the market corrects, and you've stopped your investment, you've taken your money out and you're sitting in the bank and you know, you're scared, you're worried. And the most recent event that's happened, big one, either negative or positive, can affect you. And it can affect your goals. So. It is important for us to think about when you're taking a decision, saying that, okay, what's making me take this decision, right? There's something bad that's happened in the market. It could be a global financial crisis. It could be a pandemic. I mean, those are huge ones and they will affect your decision. But when you, when you think about what decision you want to take, do take that decision on the basis of the time frame of your goals and, and then take that call. If you're very close to the end of your goal, yes, you sure you need to take some decisions uh, quickly. Uh, but if you're far away and you have time, you could, you know, you could take your time to decide what is it that you should be doing. You don't need to do what everybody else is doing necessarily. That's the point. And I think the question, therefore, that I would think you should be asking on this step is how aligned are your priorities? I mean, do you have a list of priorities and do you know what's first, second, third, fourth, and fifth? And so when you're in that investment journey, are you able to take some of those decisions on where you want to reach first and then second and then third, just like it would be in a mission? Let's move to Tarika, which is uh, simply the strategy or, and the tactics. To me, I think from an investor's perspective, this is the step which, where you're thinking about mitigating your risk. And enhancing your return, of course, is you know the other side of the coin.
But whenever we think about returns, when we read in the papers that you know the you know funds are giving great returns, markets are giving great returns. Whenever you think about returns, uh, please remember that it's only one side of the coin, and the other side of that that same coin is risk. And therefore, you know, you need to be thinking about: well, Are you getting risk-adjusted returns for what you know where you're headed? So mitigating risk is 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 the strategy step. And to me, I think that from any investor's perspective, he needs to be, he or she needs to be thinking about these uh, five things, protection, saving, investment, tax, and then wealth transfer. And it's very important. And then you think about the different asset classes that you have in your strategy that you can build the building blocks of your strategy. You've got equity, you've got debt, you've got gold and precious metals, you've got commodities, you've got currency, you've got real estate, and then you have a whole area called alternates. And in alternates come things like uh, venture funding and you know, uh, you know, the startup, you, know, you could be fund a private equity or a hedge fund, or you could be investing in, in paintings. You, you would be a lover of art and you understand art, you're investing in a, in a young painter or an established painter. You could be, it could be philately, it could be antiques, or it could be Bitcoin. It's the alternate asset class, right? Um, of course, currency, some people say, is not really, really an asset class, but I've used it because I think you can use it as well. So the seven asset classes, these are your building blocks. And the most important thing from a strategy perspective, and I think this is the one slide which you know people would think about, okay, so what's the strategy? I think uh, from my perspective, if I were to advise anybody and, and, and uh, in my family or my friend circle or any one of you, I would say, please, 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 Remember the sequence. You've got to start with protection. You've got to make sure that your insurances, your life, your health, your property is all well taken care of first. And I'm thinking about a person who is starting off on their journey of life as their first job and, you know, and thinking about being a good investor and you know, creating wealth over a period of time. Or if you're in the middle of the journey, it doesn't matter. You've got to think about your protection first and your insurances of all kinds, right? Uh, this, because you're protecting, in a sense, your source of income for your spouse and the people who depend on you. That's important. The second step in the sequence is saving. And here I mean having an emergency fund. Having an emergency fund that's maybe six months or a year of expenses that you will need and putting that away in, in, in the bank or in a savings account or a liquid fund or a, mutual, you know, a low risk mutual fund, whatever that might be. Then thinking about investment and then thinking about tax and then thinking about how are you going to transfer this wealth on to your kids or your family at the end of it. That's the sequence. And I think that sequence is extremely important to keep in mind. Don't jump straight into investments without having completed the protection and the savings uh, uh, step. Uh, don't worry so much about tax when you're thinking about investments. Think about investments for investment sake. Even income tax, the word income tax, income comes first, tax comes second. So think about the income that you're going to create and then think about the tax that you're going to pay. Don't be obsessed about it too much. And then, of course, you're thinking about wealth transfer. Apart from sequence, which is important, Anup mentioned asset allocation, the proportion that you will put into these seven uh, different asset classes or building blocks, so to speak, is extremely critical. The, some of you may have a little more in equity uh, and a less maybe in gold or currency. Uh, some of you are likely to have too much in real estate. I'm sure you'll recognize it amongst your friends or maybe, you know, maybe 10 years ago, five years ago, if you asked anybody, everybody is overweighted on their real estate, second homes, investment homes, what have you, not so much the case today. But this whole aspect of, you know, being too overbiased to any one asset class is a danger. And that's not strategic. What strategic is for your age, for your risk appetite, think about these seven asset classes and do you have money spread in most or all of them. And of course, whatever is your tactics, you, you know, build your downside protection. What is the risk here? What is the bias that is going to hit you? The bias is something called risk perception. And it's different from individual to individual. It's about overestimating or underestimating the probability of your bet. 
sometimes you're so confident that real estate is the only way to go. I mean, forget your markets, forget everything. This is what you should be doing. You're stupid. Your advice is stupid. Or sometimes it would be, look at the equity markets. Man, this is the future. And, you know, all of your money goes into, or, or, or at least. What we call it as overconfidence bias also sometimes. Uh, Japan, it is, it is. Especially what I've seen in uh, markets. When markets are high, then uh, people tend to become more confident about the markets. So the risk element goes down uh, or perception of risk goes down. And when the market Absolutely. is down, then the perception of risk goes up. So there's also market movements also kind of changes, change, uh, of changes the perception of, of risk. Yeah. Right. And Anoop, it affects everybody, right? So right. it's not as if I'm sitting here and saying it, uh, saying it and as if I don't have... Yeah, we all are kind of... Uh, yes. uh, uh, we, yeah, we are all affected by fund managers, individuals. It's just that, you know, when you're in a profession and you're thinking about it, you as an advisor or uh, my team as a fund management team, they know that the process is the king. So when they decide that you know a certain valuation is too high or that it's it's attractive, that's when they take their action. And otherwise, most individuals who may not have a framework or who may not have a process or who may not have an advisor may tend to get more affected uh, because of some of these biases a little more than uh, you know than us or people like us. So the question there, there che their checks and balances basically. Yeah, that, yeah, exactly. You got to have those checks and balances. Uh, easy to say, very difficult to do, uh, quite commonsensical again, but it's, it's quite difficult. But I think the easier way to think about it is, you know, ask this question about uh, how diversified and how sequenced is your whole portfolio? If you can just ask that question from time to time, and if you, whatever answer comes to you, I think would be the right one. Uh, the moment you see that you're too overweighted on something, you will automatically realize that you're not diversified uh, as per your age or your risk. And that and that really is a very, very individual thing. Most of us experts in financial uh, media uh, people, you know, when we give advice or when we talk about markets if we, we, or, or, or personal finance advice, it becomes very general. And uh, we've got to realize that every individual household will have their own unique needs. Somebody may have elder parents at home. Somebody may have a special child. Somebody may have just gone through a divorce. It's very different. So it's important that an advisor can sit with you and you can chat about it and find out, okay, how do I go about you know, doing something like this? So let's move on. And I'm coming to Bandopast, which is the resources that you have, that you put together. And um, uh, slightly uh, you know, sort of out of box here, maybe from what you may be expecting, but personally, I think that Personal health and well-being is your biggest strength and your biggest resource. You don't have good health and well-being. Almost everything else is senseless or useless. You can create the best wealth in the world, but if you're going to be stuck in a bed or because of, you know, uh, whatever you're ailing with or, you know, how, how are you going to enjoy that wealth? What, what, what does it all mean, right? So personal health and well-being, according to me, is a, is a resource. It's your bandobast. That's the first thing that you work on. If you think about the greatest wealth destroyer or income destroyer for most common people, it is something to do with health at the end stages of their life or, or their, you know, as they get older and the expenses of health is, you know, rising. Um, uh, you know, medical science has increased to a point where they can keep you alive and your loved ones will keep, want to keep you alive and they will simply want to spend just to make sure that you can live. And uh, sometimes it just destroys a lot of wealth. And I think we've seen that during the pandemic as well. Um, so I think personal health and well-being is your first resource. The next is your personal philosophy. Having a personal philosophy about risk, about uh, you know, what you will do and you will not do, uh, the extent to which you will bet and not bet, and what you think about uh, you know, uh, investments and savings uh, is your personal approach. And, and that should be good enough. Your personal skills comes uh, is also a bandobast uh, for you because that is one of your sources of income. That's your primary source of income. Your skill is what is getting you your income as a doctor or as a lawyer or, a, or any other professional that you might be. Uh, so working on your skills, upgrading yourself is clearly another bandobast that you should do. And uh, of course, you can have multiple sources of income. You could be getting some income from your family or from your investments or from you know, any other things that you may have, some hobby or talent. So these are, according to me, the bundle bust or the resources that an investor should have. But 
there are some things in the financial world as well. And, uh, you know, for, for the financial world, there is insurance, there's mutual funds, there's PMS, there is the liberalized remittance scheme where you can, you know, an individual can have $250,000 that you can invest abroad uh, every year, financial year. And, you know, things like international equities, as Anup mentioned, can, you know, go through that route as well. There are loans, uh, there's, of course, pension, there are wills, there's direct equity, there's, you know, there's AIF. So, so, you know, all of those are your resources for you now to think about the, how is going to fit into your strategy, which we spoke about as the earlier step. And, you know, how that's, the strategy is tuned to your goal based on all the actionable intelligence you have on the field of play that you're going to be as an investor. So that's the sequence we are, we are going through. And I, I believe that in this step, uh, diversification is the only mantra that uh, tends to work. I mean, the best of the experts, you know, obviously uh, everybody loves to look into the, you know, uh, the crystal ball and think about what's going to happen next. But, you know, something comes out of left field and uh, you don't know what's going to happen. So control the controllables, your process. And, you know, one aspect is diversification, uh, which is important. Uh, for a lot of people, for very, very, very sophisticated investors, sometimes diversification is not something that they believe in because, you know, they've reached a point where they realize that uh, they want to concentrate the bets that they want to do because that's where real wealth is created. Well, I guess if there's a lot of money, you can play some of those, uh, you know, rules as well. But what I'm talking about here is more a general rule. Again, like I mentioned earlier, you know, tend to generalize, there will be people on both ends of the spectrum for which something may not work or may work. But diversification to me, I think for uh, most of us would be the best way to deal with this. Any concentration uh, in any one single asset class that we spoke about earlier, whether it's equity or real estate or debt or gold or alternates, it can be a, a killer. So let's look at the bias when it comes to the bandobas part of it. Okay, the bias is called being captivated by stories. Okay, so sometimes we make poor decisions in allocating our resources due to all of these, you know, compelling stories that we hear. You know, we hear about it and we think about it, the advertising that hits us, you know, Sarutake Geo, and, you know, so it, it affects us, it impacts us, and we feel, hey, this is great, I need to do this. And so sometimes it's a story, it's a beautiful story, and um, you got to just check yourself to say, you know, what's the story that I'm being captivated by here? And I hope that I'm not putting all of my eggs into one basket or going after one story alone. So uh, question straightforward, you know, how are stories influencing my selection of the options I have? Let's come to the second last one, administration. The metrics of measurement, the monitoring, the frequency of review. Most ideal have a benchmark and have a time to go. These two things are very important when it comes to the step of administration. According to me, from an investor's journey perspective, I would either take the bank FD as the benchmark uh, and not, you know, just because I'm invested in equity, I take an equity benchmark necessarily. Of course, you can do that. Or you can take the nominal growth rate of a country uh, and an economy as your benchmark, because if you're investing and taking risk, you're supposed to get something better than what the, the aggregate economy is doing or uh, economy is doing on aggregate or on average. But I think a bank FD is a great benchmark to have because if you weren't doing anything with your money, you're going to be sticking it into a bank deposit probably. And so that's what you compare against and see if you're doing, you know, if you're doing well. Um, I, I would say and caution you that, uh, you know, while we, while I do think inflation is the most important thing to really get a grip around and understand, every household will have their own little inflation. So even if you read in the newspapers that the uh, inflation is five and a half percent or six percent, it may be different for you. Uh, you could have college going kids and they, if they're going abroad, <laughs> for sure, your, you know, the education inflation is very high. Or if you have anybody with uh, needing medical attention at home, you know that your inflation is probably higher than somebody who does not have that. So, uh, Keep these things in mind as you think about your benchmark and the bias that is likely to affect you is uh, something that I would call result orientation, which means the propensity to judge a decision by only its end result. 
So, uh, you know, when you're sitting with an advisor and you're looking at your portfolio and this is uh, three months after the pandemic and you're saying, hey, but what happened? You know, the, the, the portfolio is down uh, 14% or something like that. You're just looking at it in, in, a, in a, you're judging it in a very short window. You may have taken this decision five years ago that you've got to put some money aside for the next 15 years for starting a business, right? But don't judge that little outcome just because what's happened in the last three months from the, you know, hey, in the December report said something else, but the March report is saying something else to me. And why is this? And, you know, uh, I, I'd simply say that uh, while it's an important question that you will obviously be asking uh, your advisor or yourself, I think it's not something to obsess about or spend too much time about. I think what's important, therefore, my decision making at the point I made it and do most of the factors which I considered while taking that decision are those factors still relevant today. If those factors have changed, by all means, go ahead and change your, change your tactic. But if those factors haven't changed, don't react to the situation. Because if you react, you're likely to be caught out and uh, maybe you don't know when's the best entry point back or, you know, in and, you know, you get, you know, it then throws the whole plan off, possibly. So yeah, you can, ne you uh, can never time, you can never time the you market. Can, and, you, you can never. and what yeah. also happens sometimes is that when you see, like, for example, in the last one year, markets have really gone up. Uh, but you may be investing only 20% of uh, your portfolio in equity or 30% because the framework of risk that you showed, right? Uh, first, you have to make sure that you protect yeah. and save, then invest. Yeah. Uh, so you will not see those kind of returns in your portfolio because you are only investing 20%. So it's your situation, person's personal situation can be quite different. It's different. And that's where yeah. it is yeah. uh, important and to understand that. You're absolutely right. And, and I do think, therefore, that, you know, the more important aspect here is that at the point of taking a decision, you would have considered four or five factors, some assumptions, some assumptions about, you know, what is going to be maybe inflation or, you know, what's your time to go and why are you doing this and things like that. Um, you've got to just judge when, you know, at, at a later point when you're doing a review, uh, because administration is about the metrics of measurement and the frequency of review, when you're doing that review, just revisit the same factors that you, on the basis of which you took that decision and, and figure out whether, you know, it's all the same right now. And only if those things have changed, um, you know, would you then move forward in taking a decision. So let's come to the last step, Ghadi Milao, which is about synchronizing, as I mentioned, uh, synchronizing with the commander. And it's also about being disciplined. Um, I do think like Krishna uh, or Asarthi, uh, you know, having a trusted third party to guide you is quite important for most people. I'm sure there are a few people who have the, the time and the and the intelligence and the competency to do things yourself, but I think for a bulk of people, for most people, it's always good to have a third trusted third party to guide you. And the reason for that is because money decisions have very strong emotional influences, especially when you are trying to deal with your own money. You're going to be very very either too conservative or too aggressive, and you need a good trusted sounding board. And when you are are gauging an advisor or when you're talking to an advisor. At the end of the day, the, the foundation of that relationship is trust. Um, you know, I have read this in many, many, uh, you know, um, uh, expert sort of commentary that trust has a formula. Uh, trust is equal to empathy plus integrity plus reliability plus competency plus credibility. Any one factor here goes out of the window and trust goes out of the window. Uh, you know, okay, you could have a very empathetic person dealing with you who understands you very well, and maybe even is highly, um, you know, has high integrity. But well, if they don't have the competency, you're going to have a problem. Uh, but maybe, you know, he's extremely competent. Uh, but what if he's not reliable? <laughs> so, you know, every single factor matters in trust. And so whenever you do decide, and when, when, you, when you talk to your advisor, when you sit down, um, I guess it's a two-way process, but you need to build trust. One of the biases that you can have in this final step, step and Anup, you mentioned that earlier, is, is overconfidence, which is the belief that we know how to control the market, uh, which is essentially random, and we know it. 
uh, you know, at least uh, in the short term, it's, it, it's quite random. So I think overconfidence is something that affects all of us. Uh, all of these biases affect all of us. And overconfidence is the one that you need to be guarding against when you think about this final step of synchronizing yourself. And I think the question to ask is, are you, how synchronized are you with your plan? Uh, and if you're in sync with your plan and you know your advisor is also in sync with that plan, I don't think that you are going to have too much of a probability of risk or, or loss for too long. You're going to recover, you're going to do well, and you're going to meet your, your wealth goals. So let me quickly summarize uh, here in this slide. We talked about Zamini Nishan is your terrain, cover your information, Irada your goal, Tarika your strategy, Bandobast your resources, administration is your review process, and Gari Milao is, in a sense, your discipline. The challenge in when it comes to the terrain is you're likely to have a home bias in a very narrow field. Go ahead and widen the scope of what you want to do. Uh, when it comes to information, you got to guard against herd behavior and you know, chasing returns is what happens when you have herd behavior. Make sure that you have all the filters we spoke about uh, for getting actionable intelligence. Uh, as far as your goal is concerned, your bias could be recency. Uh, you know, anything that happens in the recent past, good or bad, could affect your decision. Make sure that you're well prioritized around your goals. Your strategy could be affected by your risk perception or, you know, sort of oversimplifying things. Uh, and I think the best way to take care of that is your asset allocation. Um, when you think about the resources that you will use and you will bring into this, make sure that you're not getting captivated by some beautiful marketing, uh, you know, story. Um, take it, uh, don't take it at face value. Think about it. If it appeals to you, sure, by all means, you can go ahead. But, you know, apply some common sense along the way. I'm sure all of us do that. And I think one way to think about your resourcing is also to make sure that you're well sequenced. Administration, uh, your, your, your bias could be just having too much result orientation and reacting to it. Think about your decisions when you took them in the first place and review if those factors have changed, only then change. And the last is that you could have overconfidence in trying to control something that's really random, have a plan and be in sync with that plan. Let me also say that when we think about all of this planning and the Z-Kidback framework, it is also the army who says that the battle plan is the first casualty of war. So you may have a fantastic plan, but you know, it's, it's when you get into the ring, you know, uh, uh, you, you're going to go, you know, all guns blazing. Sometimes you don't think of the plan. It happens to the, to the best of us. But I think just being planned will have you more prepared than the next man. And, um, and, and that's essentially what, you know, what you're trying to do. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I was reading a Morgan Housel piece uh, recently, and this is more for people in the beginning of their financial journey. If all of that, you know, of all of that uh, Z kid back framework was too much to even, you know, it may sound very interesting, but, you know, still thinking about it. Then here's what Morgan Housel says is the best way to go towards your wealth, especially if you're starting off, right? Number one, spend less than you earn. Number two, save the difference. Number three, take the help of a trusted advisor and invest in a diversified portfolio. Number four, have patience. That's it. That's the only four steps for anybody who's starting new. And that's, that's by uh, you know, Morgan Housel. I couldn't have said it, uh, or nobody could have said it more simpler and easier. A lot of people find it difficult on step number one and step number four. <laughs> Just spending less than you earn is sometimes tough with, with all of what's around us. And you know, it's made it so easy for us to click and buy today. So it's difficult. And of course, having patience is uh, very difficult as well. So thank you very much uh, for the time that you have given me. I'll, I'll, I'll open it up to Anoop and uh, the team at Scriptbox if, to see if there are any questions. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, people do not decide their futures. They decide their habits and their habits decide their future. So happy investing. And I hope that a little bit of the army has got into you as well. So thank you very much. And I'm going to stop uh, sharing here. Anoop, over to you. I hope that thank was you. good. Thank you so much, Ajit, and uh, uh, wonderful uh, laying that framework uh, in the in the inv investment landscape, I should say. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, and you're right. First punch you get, right, and uh, the plans can go awry, right. So, it's very very important that uh, yeah. we stick to the plan and we keep revisiting those plans. Uh, 
like you have said and i you know, there's, a, there, there's a yeah there's a there's a, a, a nice one on this one where a journalist was interviewing mike tyson before one of his uh, great bouts and the journalist asked uh, tyson that uh, you know uh, what's your plan what's your strategy when you're going into the ring uh, and tyson happened to tell the journalist everybody has a plan till you're punched in the face until punched in the face yes, <laughs> yes exactly so that's what happens so no wonderful uh, like uh, and uh, all the biases that you talked about and biases are so so important in investments and uh, it's to be and we all like you said even though we are experts and we we would like to believe that we are not biased but actually we are also right but what also happens in our cases because we follow a process there are checks and balances it helps us you uh, know at least uh, curb those biases Absolutely. so it's very very important to be aware of those biases and thank you so much for laying down that framework uh, there are some questions ajit uh, so we have some few minutes so i'll just take quickly some questions sure uh sure since we talked about valuations and all should i enter the market at these high valuations well um you know if you thought of the framework here that we were speaking about i think the question i would ask you is uh you know what is your goal and what is your time frame to that goal uh valuations will not matter if you are uh doing you know if you're investing for the next 10 years or 7 years or 15 years uh, for a particular goal um it will matter only if you are thinking about a, a short term goal for which you are thinking of entering into the market and when we think about valuations of the market also remember that you know it is in aggregate uh you know it's the valuation of the aggregate market there could be various pockets within that uh, market which may not necessarily be at stretched valuations it's the job of a fund manager therefore to to look at those valuations and see whether it is um, way out of whack and then decide the right uh, portfolio to build so to me i think that uh, i won't be able to answer that question completely uh, you know really without knowing what's your time frame if you have a long time frame to your goal uh, don't worry about uh, you know valuations worry about your asset allocation and whether you have any equity at all uh, or you don't have anything if you don't any time is a good time to enter the market you can you know you can be in a in a fund uh, that your advisor can help you with script box can help you with possibly and um uh, uh as i also mentioned valuations could be different across the market so a, you know a good professional advice or a portfolio actually helps you uh, get over it um i will also add that uh, you know valuations are because you know prices have run up with a lot of money entering the market whereas earnings have not yet caught up uh, it is uh, mostly what you will hear experts talking about is that now that you know we have come through the second wave uh, and the fact that we feel that we possibly may be better prepared even if there is a third wave let's all hope so and and i hope that will happen then you know there's more predictability now coming up and therefore there's possibly more predictability of earnings as well and you know when earnings catch up some of this will automatically readjust to where it is uh but what's important is to make sure that you have the right advice and you have the right portfolio for your specific situation yeah it's important to have that goals right so always keep in mind the goals and don't get uh, uh knocked out with the first punch of the market or uh, if the valuation goes high that uh, what what is happening so just so uh, uh, take the leaf out and of uh, the mahavarata playbook and uh, many times it uh, helps to have that krishna right the advisor sarthi <laughs> yeah. for for your portfolio right. which which is uh, very important and you talked about that in gadi milao uh and the risk management is the most important thing right so the valuation right. when you manage the risk then the higher valuation lower valuation will not really uh, matter because you're really kind of sticking to your asset allocation plan you're sticking to your goals plan you're sticking to your investment plan mm -hmm. and accordingly and of course if you have an advisor to support you then they will also hand hold you through those uh, through that yeah. journey it helps uh Definitely. since we were talking about biases how to tackle biases which comes from short term goal either to invest in risky asset or safer asset um to me i think that the way to think about your goals is uh you know not being not being stuck with that bias is as i had mentioned earlier uh to prioritize your goals um so you know when you are thinking about prioritizing your goals because you know you have limited savings or money kept aside to do something 
then you've got to be very clear about your priorities. If you get, if you think that you have this, you know, couple of lakhs of rupees and that's really much of your savings and you think, my God, I think that people are making money in Bitcoin. Shall I do it? Because, you know, it seems to be on fire and maybe I'll make some money. And, you know, in priority, actually, uh, there is something that you would need to do for yourself in terms of maybe, you know, uh, following a hobby or, or a business or something for the family. And uh, you're taking a big risk then if you are taking a short term goal based on very, very recent information. So if you if you prioritize your goals and if you say that, listen, come what may, this is my goal number one, two, three and four, then whatever's happening in the short term, I think it'll it'll automatically come in perspective for you, whether you should be indulging in it or not indulging in it. And uh, it's a tough one. Uh, it's very easy for me to speak about it, but every individual will will struggle with it. Uh, I think asking the right questions, I think sequencing your portfolio, uh, as I mentioned, first make sure that your protection requirements are done, your emergency funding is done. If both of those are done, you could take a little bit more risk because you're now entering into investments. If those first two steps aren't done, don't get uh, swung by something short term. So sequence and priority of your goals, I think that's the you know, better way to sort of approach it. Yeah, there's, there's something called as uh, risk uh, ability or uh, ability to take risk and uh, willingness to take risk. So what we when we are talking about that sequence is the ability that we have. Then there's a psychological aspect, which also has the biases built in, right? So the willingness yeah, yeah. to take risk. So when you have the more ability to take risk, then then you can probably go higher in equity. And uh, but yeah, the, of course, yeah. you should not be bothered by the volatility of the market, right? So that uh, also kind of plays <laughs> on people's minds. Uh, the, the, the third aspect, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the third aspect there is risk capacity. So risk ability, risk willingness and risk capacity. You may have the capacity, not the ability uh, or the willingness or, you know, sort of vice versa. So, um, I mean, these are, I guess, more jargons that, uh, you know, behavioral finance experts will build into it. But as I mentioned earlier, every individual situation is unique. My personal advice is, as I spoke about earlier, uh, think through your sequence and think through your priorities, uh, you'll pr pretty much arrive at your own answers, which will be good for you. Uh, you don't need anything else there. There are a couple of more questions. I'll quickly take them uh, and, uh, yeah. and then uh, we can wrap up. Present situation, we can withdraw or keep up still in long-term investment capital. What your suggestion? I think it's, it's uh, related to that high valuation question only. So again, uh, yeah. what we would say is that it's uh, according to your asset allocation and uh, diversification and your yeah. risk profile. Yeah, and if you have a long-term view, Correct. then uh, these short-term uh, market movements is not something uh, that uh, that should matter. But yes, if you have an advisor, definitely that advisor would help you uh, in guiding uh, the path, yeah. guiding your path. Then there's uh, one question: How to plan Correct. for different roles with different timelines, and what should be the instrument to be used? Stocks or mutual fund? This goes to financial planning. So you need to kind of do your financial planning yeah. with uh, different goals with different timelines. And uh, what instruments to use? Again, it depends upon what asset classes are suitable for your risk profile and for your particular situation. So it can be, it will be sort of customized or it can be very specific to personal needs. Anything you want to add there, Ajit? Yeah, I, I, I can probably add uh, two things. One is that, and again, I'm going back to the presentation where I talked about the tarika and uh, the strategy and uh, uh, you know the fact that you have these seven asset classes equity fixed income gold and precious metals commodities currency real estate and alternates uh, I, the way i would think about it is that when you are faced with this question for instance that is the present markets too too expensive should i get out i mean should i book my profits or what should i do uh, i will go back to exactly what you said anup which is that you know what is your asset allocation how is your money divided between these seven asset classes or at least six of them or five of them and uh, then take your decision if you think that in your asset allocation your equity is looking quite big book some profits move it maybe into gold or fixed income or you know um, into uh, something like a real estate investment trust or rates that you can buy in the market so you have some exposure there if you think you're already having a lot of exposure to real estate then choose something else that you can get into but essentially diversify uh, based off you know as anup mentioned your risk and you know what are your existing asset allocation is. And, and mind you, when you're thinking about it and you look at your, let's say, just your equity investments, uh, equity itself, you know, while I've talked about these seven asset classes, 
um, you can drill down into each one of them, right? For instance, when I say real estate, it could be residential, commercial, or land. Similarly, when I'm talking equity, it could be large cap, mid cap, small cap, it could be passives, it could be you know, international equities. You have so many uh, different possibilities under each asset class. Uh, gold is not gold alone, but you know, precious metals of gold, diamond, platinum, they're all legitimate investment classes. So if you think that your investments have you know, sort of ballooned and you're a little uncomfortable, Look at that equity, stay put in equity if you have to, but just make sure that you have enough diversification within equity itself. Because one of the common mistakes that I do see or common, well, let me not call it a mistake. I, I probably say people don't realize it, is the overlap. You might be holding you know, six different funds and thinking you're pretty safe. You look at the underlying portfolio and the top five, seven stocks are exactly the same across you know, all of those funds. So uh, if you could get that information, it's not so easy for somebody to get it. You've got to invest some time and energy or check with your advisor, which they can definitely help you with. Uh, make sure that whatever you invested in has lower overlap with each other. Uh, that at least guarantees you a little better diversification. Yeah, it's, it's, very, it's a very important point uh, uh, that you make, Ajit. Sometimes having all five-star funds may not mean that you've got adequate uh, diversification because they may have the same underlying uh, holdings, exactly. right? So, and I, exactly. those, those funds are good, right? But if you choose all three of them, yeah, absolutely. essentially you are just choosing the same uh, wine into three different bottles or uh, whatever, no? So same investment Correct. In three, with three different Correct. names, right? So it's very important to look at so, that over, uh, over overlap analysis uh, is also very important. Absolutely. I think we are out of time. So I'm going to wrap up uh, sure. uh, Ajit. Uh, what is the my biggest takeaway is that uh, one thing that you started with saying that uh, when you make decisions with the brain, right? The brain doesn't know what decisions it is making actually. It's a very important concept. And uh, I read it somewhere sometime back also about this. And I was also intrigued by the whole fact about how does, how does it work? But it also kind of leads to that we have biases. So please be aware of those biases, right? So Correct. just because we feel that uh, we are rationally taking a decision uh, and there is a concept called rational economic man, uh, but actually that irrational exuberance <laughs> or uh, disappointment <laughs> can always happen and tends to happen a lot in investment. So be aware of those investment biases so thank you so much, Ajit, for those valuable insights uh, and uh, relating the Z Kitback framework to uh, investment or biases in investments. Viewers, if you have further queries, please contact your relationship manager or use our website, scriptbox.com, to get answers. For all your financial and investment-related requirements, please download our app. Do visit us on various social media platforms and subscribe to our channel, Scriptbox, on YouTube. If you have liked this webinar, do talk about it on social media platforms. Like I mentioned in the Thank beginning, we have recently launched international stocks offering through our partnership with StockAl. Please check this out on our platform. Thank you to all the participants for joining us today. We hope to see you again in our forthcoming webinars. This is Anup Bansal from Scriptbox wishing all of you the best of health. Thank you, Anup. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And let me also wish the best of health to everybody, uh, all viewers. Stay safe. Uh, you know, I only have Captain Raghuraman and people like Morgan Housel who make it very simple for us to uh, understand this very complicated journey of uh, saving and investing. I hope you found it useful. Thank you. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully before investing.